We're going to go through interpretation of line integrals of vector fields. Now, there's several kinds of line integrals we're going to look at. I'm going to assume that you know how to compute the curl and divergence of a vector field, and that you have seen line integrals of this sort, and that an integral like this you turn into a standard Calc 1 style integral like that. Um, you may have been told that this kind of integral converts into this, or you might use, you know, fundamental theorem of line integrals if that applies. But really, the reason why might be a little unclear. So in this video, we're going to try to explain why this formula is right. And in fact, in order to do that, we're going to, uh, alongside this, uh, provide some kind of explanation for what this means besides the standard explanation that if f, this vector field, if that's force, that uh, the line integral, the scalar you get would be work. So, I mean, as true as that is, it's nice to have another interpretation and then these two things will go hand in hand. Um, in addition, we'll introduce or try to explain what circulation and flux are. Um, they happen to be different line integrals of vector fields, so we'll talk through that. Uh, we'll give a geometric interpretation of what curl and divergence are. And again, you should know how to compute them, but what do they really mean? We'll talk about that. And then these things are all related to each other, circulation, flux, curl, and divergence, um, through the various versions of Green's theorem. So we'll try to talk through how those all relate to each other. So the basic setup looks like this. I'm going to use blue for my vector fields and red for uh, the line, excuse me, or the curve. And um, if you'd like to play around using an app of some kind, here are the details that you won't really need this. Uh, we'll draw in the vector field first, and then the curve parameterized by R is this curve C here. Um, sorry, I didn't draw in the direction of travel, but it is this way, which I think I can convince you of because um, the Y coordinate for the parameterization is just simply T over two, and T starts at negative one and ends at 10. So how are we to really interpret what this integral is? Well, one, the standard explanation is, imagine that all of these are forces or pushes, and if something travels along this path, then how much work was done by this force in moving an object all the way through this path like that? Um, but another explanation would just be, uh, sort of as you travel along here, you can think of a unit vector. So, you know, as you travel, say, eastward, like right here, right at this point, there would be a vector pointing that way. And say right here, there'd be a vector pointing directly north. And over here, there'd be a vector pointing mostly to the east and slightly north. But along each point, um, there's a unit vector. And roughly speaking, you're just going to take that vector and dot with whatever blue vector you have right around it. Of course, I didn't draw in every vector of the vector field. That would just fill up the screen. So to really get sort of the point across, as is usually done in integrals, and this, is, this example is not perfect, but let's just split up this parameterized curve into a bunch of, well, they're not equal size pieces. I just, for convenience for the computer, I just picked t one unit spaced apart. So there's t is negative one, t is zero, t is one, t is two, and so on. And at each of these points, there's a vector. And I asked the computer to sort of roughly try to draw the vector. And if you take this tiny magnitude vector and dot with, well, it's not this vector, but you know the, the blue vector that should be here is kind of close to that. If you dot the two to to, together, because the angle created between the two vectors is acute, you're going to get a positive number. And that number would have been bigger had this magnitude been bigger. Um, somewhere over here, you have roughly perpendicular. So this vector dot with this blue vector. Uh, well, perpendicular vectors dot to zero. Um, and so at each of these points, so to speak, you're going to take the dot product of the purple vector along with the blue vector from the vector field. And if you add up all of those values, then you get a rough approximation of this integral here. And it, this sort of even gives off the reason why this looks the way it does, because uh, the purple vector is f of r of t, right? So for a fixed value of t, like t is one, uh, zero, sorry, negative one, zero, two, three, let's just say t is three, then f of r of three would be, well, this purple vector right here. And that vector is supposed to dot with, uh, oh, sorry, uh, f of r of three is, is the blue vector that's located here. So maybe let's just pretend it's really this vector, just slide that vector over here. And then r prime of three is, well, that vector. And so those are, being dotted together. Um, but that's not very accurate, of course. And the standard thing is to improve your accuracy by splitting up um, your t interval 
which is of length 10, not in 10 equal size pieces, but let's say 20 equal size pieces. So now there's twice as many dots here. And at each of these places, now we sample for a vector. And of course, you can keep, you know, doing better and better by sampling more and more points. And, you know, the whole idea is you're accumulating uh, dot product values. So the dot product of the vector along this path, along with whatever blue vector is sort of in the background for the vector field F. So uh, if the vectors point in the same direction, then you're going to get a positive value. If you if you have vectors pointing in opposite directions or beyond 90 degrees, degrees apart, well, the dot product then would be negative. So is the value going to be positive or negative? Well, that depends on how much, so to speak, the path you travel along agrees with the direction of the, the vectors that you have. So to try to illustrate this, not perfectly quantitatively, but at least qualitatively, I'd like to take a look at a couple other paths. So if you took this red path, C for the red path, uh, in this mostly northeast direction, then there's mostly, I mean, there's agreement with the arrows and basically parallel to these vectors. So traveling this direction, if you parameterize the path this way, you're going to get a very positive number. And if you travel this way, you well, you'd have to get a negative number because the, the, the tangent vector along here would always point towards the southwest, and yet these blue vectors point to the northeast. So you're going to get all these negative values, you're just adding up all these negative numbers. Um, on the other hand, if you travel along this C, then for the most part, it appears anyway, I mean, it's not perfect, but it appears that basically the blue vector and the purple vector that would be tangent, that would travel in the same direction as this red, well, the, those would be basically perpendicular, so you're just going to basically get the products of zero. I bet if you computed this line integral of a vector field along this path for this blue vector field, you're going to get a number that's really close to zero, whether you travel this way or that way because of the perpendicularity. Um, you can do the same thing over a closed curve. So if, if C happens to just be, say, counterclockwise, a cl closed curve around here, same thing. You're talking about, well, how, you know, how much agreement um, is there between the arrow that's pointing in, you know, constantly in this direction? So like from here, there'd be a tangent vector that points mostly to the southwest, right? And that, that vector really disagrees with the blue arrows that are in this region in the northeast. But if you travel all the way around, you know, you can still do that. And so this, this line integral still has the same meaning. Now, when you have a closed curve, it's actually nice to go back to the water uh, analogy. And, and we would say that you know, imagine the blue is really showing you the current of water, then this integral is calculating for you how much water is really traveling along this path. And if if water is not perfectly traveling, let's say right here, where the direction of travel is perfectly east, if the water starts to spill that way, well, you're losing some of this water oh, from, from being on the path. And maybe somewhere else, maybe somewhere else, you know, you're, you're uh, you, you gain water from, say, out here, like with the currents the way they are, moving into the path a little bit. So this is not a perfect, uh, it's, it's not easy to describe, but how much water is flowing along this direction uh, with the idea that any water that might spill out, like right here, it seems to be the case that the way the currents are, all this water would spill out over here, but maybe you'd gain this back somewhere else. But how much water spins along this path, literally in this direction, along, all in all these directions along each point? That's called the circulation. Uh, over is really sort of the right word to use. So, or or really along is the right word to use. But we use over simply because we think of integral over c. And there's another line integral we should discuss. Um, and the notation looks quite different. Um, and I chose a different vector field to illustrate what's going on, but I chose the same c. And with this dot n, this is supposed to be the normal vector to the curve c. And the whole point of this integral is it's no longer how much agreement along here, because that was a dot d boldface r. Now, when you have a dot n ds, this integral here represents uh, how much water is leaving outside of this, this here. So imagine you have uh, sort of like a, I mean, if this is all flat in two, 2D space, but let's still imagine that you have uh, a curtain set up or really sort of a wall, a porous wall with holes in it. And, you know, it looks like from here, there's sort of this spot, like, let's say, uh, right right above this point. So, like, if you're standing right in front of the video, uh, where where you are positioned, that let's say, like, a faucet gets turned on and then the water spills from where you're located towards the screen and then the water dissipates in all directions from here. Okay. So this this could sort of be uh, 
like a, a, a wall of sponges that are positioned around and how much water is going through the sponges through all these locations that's its integral and this is called the flux the word over only appears because you, we think of a line integral over C, but really a nice word to use to think of the water model that we're thinking of is the standard terminology is to say the flux of the vector field across this curve C, okay, across a closed curve. Now there's a related concept of flux, which was how much water is leaving this entire, uh, this uh, outside of this red uh, curve here. Um, and instead, so there's sort of a mini version of flux called divergence. So uh, divergence, um, which again, I'm assuming you know how to compute, is, is a scalar. And what is the scalar? It's supposed to represent how much liquid is leaving from a particular location using the water uh, model. So let's say like right here, it looks like all arrows are facing away from this location x comma y. So from uh, 1, 2, 3 and a half, 3.5 comma 1, 2, 3. So roughly 3.5 comma 3, um, the divergence at 3.5 comma 3 really is, uh, I don't know what just happened there, um, it really is a positive number. And other places it's sort of hard to perfectly quantify the divergence. I think somewhere over here there's as many incoming arrows as there are outgoing arrows. So the di net change is the divergence is zero. In the next example, um, I have arrows pointing inward towards this location, and so at this spot, the divergence is now negative. Um, what about curl? Well, curl is really only naturally understood for three-dimensional vector fields, so I took this from uh, this website where they have kindly given a Creative Commons license, and uh, the idea is at a particular location x, comma y, comma z, um, perhaps if you could leave a ball located at that spot, maybe the ball would spin on its own axis. I mean, take a look at this website, wonderful interactive apps. And the amount of spin would be the magnitude of a vector, and then the direction of spin, or rather the normal vector to the direction of spin, would be the vector that would give you curl. Now, if you put all of these things together, you actually get uh, one of the standard versions of Green's theorem, um, which looks like this. And if you think, if you just reinterpret uh, by thinking of a two-dimensional vector field that's p comma q, then the left side really just says this. I mean, these really, this and this, they say the same thing. And then uh, if you work out from a previous video, the stuff in parentheses here really is curl of f dotted with k. But what is this integral? Well, if c is closed, which is really required for Green's theorem, is a closed curve, then this was just what we mentioned earlier. This is the circulation of the vector field along the curve c. So circulation is sort of a macroscopic curl, because curl is just saying how much, how much does the water current sort of rotate uh, a ball, a sphere located just in that local little area, and circulation is sort of the, the bigger picture, right? So it sort of makes sense that if you add up a bunch of these little circles, uh, little amounts of rotation, that you'd have the overall amount of rotation, which is called circulation. Now, if you take that versions of, version of Green's theorem and you replace each p with a negative q and each q with a negative p, then you'll get a new theorem. So try it. Pause the video. Replace every p that one and that one with negative q. Replace each q with a positive p. So there and there. And then simplify a little bit. And this is what you get from direct replacement. So literally that p was replaced with a negative q. And this p here was replaced with a negative q. And now let's simplify. I just will switch the order of terms here. And well, negative and negative is a positive, And you just get this. Now this is another standard version of Green's theorem. So this is a scalar version of Green's theorem, as well as this is a scalar version of Green's theorem. But they're they're so they say different. I mean, even though they include basically the same information, they have different physical interpretations. So if you go back to thinking about a two-dimensional vector field, this left side it takes a bit of work to actually show it. But this is actually um, this integral. We and we sort of saw this a little bit earlier. Um, and this side, well, take a look at what's in parentheses. That's just the divergence of, of a two-dimensional vector field. And what was this? Well, this was the flux of the vector field C across the closed curve C. Okay. Flux of the vector field F across the closed curve C. Now, as a 
what we had just done was we took this circulation curl scalar form of Green's theorem and obtained this scalar version of the flux divergence form of Green's theorem. I'd like you to, uh, just as a challenge, take the flux divergence version of Green's theorem, the scalar version, and answer this question. What would you have to replace each P with? What would you have to replace each Q with so that you get the scalar version of the circulation curl version of Green's theorem? 